the past few weeks, we have been uh, in a series called The New Creation in Christ, uh, Body, Soul, and Spirit. And, and this is off of a scripture verse uh, that uh, in 1 Thessalonians 5.23, um, uh, Paul writes, And the very God of peace sanctify you wholly, and I pray, God, your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. And so... God is a triune being, Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. And He created us in His image, which doesn't mean that we look like God, but He created us in His image as a triune being. We are, our, uh, we are body, soul, and spirit. We are made up, we are three things, but one whole thing. And, and so I'm not going to re-preach all the sermons from before, but let me give you a quick recap. Our soul is who we are. It is the depths of who we are. The things that come out of us are represented by our soul, our heart, our mind. Everything about us is our soul. And um, our soul feeds one of two things. Our body, which is our flesh, or our spirit. Our soul is going to have desires for one or the other, and it typically leans towards the flesh. Until you get saved. And when we start living for the Lord, you start having this desire to live in the Spirit. But you have these two things warring inside of you. Chasing after the flesh or chasing after the Spirit. And so last week we discussed the flesh and crucifying our flesh. And, and, and that we are to keep ourselves holy before God. And... Um, it's something that we live in the grace of God, and we can't just try to not sin anymore. But how do we try? To, how do we stop sinning whenever our flesh desires to sin? Well, if we keep feeding ourselves sinful things, putting sinful things in our minds, and putting sinful desires before our face, and chasing after and doing everything that comes across our path. We feed the flesh and we chase after the things that are not of God. And then that takes us to the Spirit. Romans 7, 25 says, I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord so that with the mind I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh the law of sin. And as we look at the Spirit today, our Spirit is unique in that it is what comes alive when you get saved. Your Spirit becomes alive when you get saved. And, and well, does Scripture say that? Well, well, we'll take a look at that. But what does the Spirit do? When your Spirit is alive, it gives you communion with God. Those that are saved have direct access to the throne of God. You know, we no longer need a high priest to go into the Holy of Holies. I talked about that last week. You don't need a high priest to go in there for you. You don't need to go to a confessional. As much as I love to pray with people through the things in their life at the altar, and, and we are to lay hands on people, lay hands on people and pray for them to be healed. Uh, scripture tells us to confess our sins one to another that we shall be saved. And, and that is about accountability to try to keep yourself on track in the Lord. But you do not need to confess your sins to me and me pray some blessing over you to be forgiven. You confess your sins to God. But the access to that throne, the access to, to have that ability is because you are alive in Christ. You believe in Jesus Christ that he was crucified and resurrected. And it gives you the authority and the ability to go boldly before the throne of grace to receive mercy in your time of need. Romans chapter 8 verse 10 says this. And if Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the spirit is life because of righteousness. Is that your righteousness? 
No. <laughs> Scripture tells us that our righteousness is as filthy rags. They're disgusting. <laughs> How many Christians walk around and they look good and they act good and they're just whitewashed tombs. They're dead inside. You know, they, the, the legalistic Christian, I've got to be careful, I'm going to start preaching a sermon I'm preaching in a few weeks. But the legalistic Christian that has, everything has to go perfectly the way that they think it should go, they've set out the rules and they've made the law, and if you don't follow what they say, you're not a Christian. And that's not Scripture. We need to die to ourselves and walk in the Spirit. Verse 16 of Romans 8 says this, The Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. We are the children of God. When we get saved, when we, can, when we confess our sins to the Lord, when we believe on Jesus Christ, it makes our spirit alive. We are alive in Christ and because of that, we become adopted, which I'll get to in a minute, but we become adopted into the family of God, into the promise of God, and we inherit eternal life with Jesus Christ. And it's not because of our own works. Again, because our righteousness is nothing. It is because of the righteous blood of Jesus that covers our sins. But just because the righteous blood of Jesus covers our sins does not give us the right and authority to just keep living in our sin. You see, something important to know is that the flesh will kill the spirit. The flesh will kill the spirit. Romans 8 10 through 13, it says, If Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the Spirit is life because of righteousness, His righteousness. But if the Spirit of Him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, He that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by His Spirit that dwelleth in you. Therefore, brethren, we are debtors not to the flesh to live after the flesh. For if you live after the flesh, you shall die. But, I love those words in the Bible, but if ye through the Spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, you shall live. What does mortify mean? I know I'm reading some King James as we go through this, and, and, and there's a reason why, because some of this wording is so important to understand. To mortify is to completely Reject and to kill and to destroy the sin of your life. The deeds of the body need to be rejected. Well, does that mean that I can't have any fun? Well, I've been a Christian for a long time and I know how to fun, have fun. But if all you're doing is chasing after the fun things of the world, you're not chasing after God. Because I can promise you this, that if you're chasing after the Spirit and you are alive in Christ, you're going to have joy that passes all understanding. You're going to have peace in your life that passes all understanding. But if all you do is seek to gratify, gratify the desires of the flesh, you are always going to feel empty and alone inside and broken inside because the joy of the Lord is not in you. The Spirit of God has not made you alive and you are dead inside. When we feed the flesh, it overtakes our spirit. And verse 13 says, ye shall die. We are dead because of sin in our life. Now, when you read these things in, in Romans and, and most of the letters that Paul wrote, most of what Paul writes, he was not writing to the unsaved. This is something that's very important to understand. Paul was not writing these letters to the unsaved people of Rome. He was writing them to the church. Why would he be telling the people in the church that they need to crucify the flesh, otherwise they're going to die? 
There is a, a belief that is, that, that is out there that just because you said a prayer or you believed in your heart for a moment, that nothing you ever do will separate you from God. And that is a lie from the devil. It is the same question that the, the devil put into the mind of Adam and Eve in the garden. Did God really say that you will die? If you disobey him. Yes he did. Absolutely. Does that mean that because you make some mistakes. I, I always like to point this out. Does that mean because you make mistakes. And, and you sin here or there. And you're chasing after the Lord. But you're making some mistakes. Does that mean that you're bound for hell every time you make a mistake. No. That is not what that means. But if there is sin in your life and you are constantly chasing after that sin, that means that you are gratifying the flesh desires and your spirit is rejecting God. You are not chasing after God, you're chasing after the desires of the flesh and it kills you dead. But if we crucify our flesh through the spirit, we have life. As we feed the Spirit, as we chase after the Lord, we feel more and more alive. Now the enemy will do everything he can to try to shut you down. He will throw every single thing he can at your life to try to destroy you. You ever notice that one day you are on top of the mountain with God, and the next it feels like you're sinking in the mud? It's because the enemy has an arsenal of weapons that he knows exactly how to use. And anyone that thinks that they can just stand up against the devil without the power of Christ are fooling themselves. We're told to put on the full armor of God. That we can stand against the wiles of the devil. The wiles. Anybody ever remember Wiley Coyote? You know, I don't even know if Looney Tunes do much of anything on TV anymore. But, but when I was younger, the Looney Tunes, they were tough. And that, that rabbit, he was about as mean as they come, you know. But the coyote, he was wily coyote. Why was he wily? Because he came up with all these schemes and gimmicks to try to get the rabbit. He'd come up with everything. He'd paint the side of a rock somewhere in New Mexico. Apparently it was right outside of Albuquerque because Bugs Bunny would take a, a wrong turn there in Albuquerque. And, uh, um, but I don't know how Bugs Bunny could run through the paint job on the rock, but the coyote would always smash right into it. He'd try to launch a rocket at him and he'd blow it up. One day I was driving from Arizona across New Mexico and I passed the very large array. That's what it's called. It's a giant array of satellites. It's the largest one in, in the United States. And, and I was driving down the road, and I, I kid you not, a roadrunner ran right out in front of my car. Again, anybody in here ever seen a roadrunner? They're, they're pretty quick. And I'm telling you, it wasn't two minutes later, a coyote ran across out in front of my car. And I'm like, all I need is a rocket. And I got to a town called Socorro, New Mexico. And Socorro is right outside of white, I think it's called White Sands, where they, uh, they, they build and they uh, test uh, rockets, <laughs> military rockets. And sure enough, I pull up to the gas station and there's a big red rocket sitting in front of the gas station. And I'm like, it's come full swing. <laughs> but the devil's scheme, he is constantly scheming. And unlike the coyote that never catches the rabbit, he's really good at catching you because he knows all of the things that people have been doing for thousands of years. And he's been tricking them since the dawn of time. And the devil comes in and something's going wrong in, wrong in your life. And it's not going the way that you think it should. And in your flesh, you're starting to think, is God even real? And the devil, 
or one of his little minions, because the devil, unlike God, is not everywhere all the time. But they will whisper in your ear, did God really say that you can trust in him? Did God really say that you're supposed to have faith in him? Don't you think that in these moments you should deny that God and do what you think is best right now for you and your family? Follow your heart. One of the biggest arguments that I've, and I'll say arguments, usually I say intense discussions, but this has been a very big argument I've been having recently with some folks that have denied the authority of the Bible, the authority of Scripture. Why would anybody want to deny the authority of Scripture? So they can do what they want and manipulate people into what they want them to do rather than giving them the Word of God. That's it. And trust me, it's been going on a lot longer than a couple hundred years. It's been going on for thousands of years because the devil comes in with his schemes and he says, did God really say? Yes, he did. To be alive in Christ, you need to be in the Spirit. And if you are in the Spirit of God and you're chasing after the Lord, not just reading the Word. That's important because you're putting the Word in your mind. But you've got to be in prayer. And when things come your way, how many of you all know, how how many of you all have ever made a mistake on purpose? Come on now, there's nobody raising their hand in this place. Anybody ever made a mistake on purpose? You don't typically make mistakes on accident. Now, there's accidents that happen. I'm not saying that. But anybody ever had something happen to them when they were at the wrong place at the wrong time and they knew they shouldn't have been there in the first place? And then something went wrong? Oops. You were doing something and you didn't think you were going to get caught and then you got busted driving down the road and all of a sudden those little red lights are flashing. Well, officer, I didn't realize I was speeding. But I had the cruise control set on 15 miles an hour over. I'd never do anything like that. Not 15 miles an hour over. That's crazy. Uh, Most of us don't sin on accident. We're either where we're not supposed to be, knowing we shouldn't be there, or we're making a decision in the moment, and in our mind we know we shouldn't be doing that thing. And it doesn't take a genius to know, oh, well, you know, Maybe I shouldn't be sitting down having dinner with this lady that's not my wife. Oh, well, I'm going to go be a good witness for Christ. You know, I I was an alcoholic, and and I think that maybe I want to go reach the people at the bar. Don't worry, nothing will happen. Well, I understand that I'm a new Christian And I want to reach my buddies for Christ, so I'm going to go to where they're at doing the things that they're doing, but I won't sin. Well, we make these decisions because we're putting ourselves too close to gratifying the flesh, and in the moment, almost every time, we make the wrong decision. And it is a decision. It's a decision. Now, I'm not saying that there's people that haven't made mistakes. We can't not make decisions in our lives. So many people, they don't do anything because they're afraid of what might happen. And we can't live a life being afraid because there's no fear. God hasn't given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of righteousness. Some people will say, well, pastor, I'm not sure if I'm supposed to do this thing for God or that thing for God. Well, just make a decision, do one of them, and if he doesn't want you to do it, then switch over to the other. You're not sinning because you've done one thing for God or that thing for God. But if you know that the thing you're getting ready to do is unholy and unrighteous, or you can do the other thing, and you're like, well, I think it'll be okay this one time. No, it won't be okay this one time. You're gratifying the flesh. You're not walking in the spirit. 
I better hurry. The flesh is death, and in the spirit is life, and we must feed the spirit. Romans 8, 14 tells us that we have a spirit of adoption. Of adoption? Aren't we born as children of God? Well, no. God does create us all. He creates us all to be his children. But there are many people out there that say, aren't we all children of God? No, we are not all children of God. Only those people that believe in Jesus and walk in the Spirit of God are the children of God. Well, does it say that somewhere in the Bible? Well, I'm glad you asked. In Romans chapter 8, verses 14 through 17, it says, For as many are... As many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are sons of God. Who? Those that are led by the Spirit of God. For you have not received the spirit of bondage, again, to fear, but ye have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, if so be that we suffer with him, that we may also, that we may, we may be also glorified together. We suffer on this earth. Jesus suffered on this earth. But the glory that is in heaven that awaits us is an inheritance from God. We're co-heirs with Christ. But we are adopted into the family of God. The only being born into the family of God is when you're born again. And you receive the spirit of adoption. You become a child of God. And what's interesting is it, it's not really the case anymore, but accor- uh, according to Jewish culture, this is how adoption works. You don't belong to me, but I adopt you. I take you in and make you one of my own children. And no one on this earth could ever take you away from that adoption. No one can come in and say, oh, that's not your kid. Yes, that's my kid. I have adopted them. Now, wait a minute. Pastor, are you going once saved, always saved on us? No, no, I'm not finished. You see, even the parent themselves cannot disown the child that they adopted. Laws have changed now, but this we're going back to old Jewish law, and this is how God bases things. Is that's why he gave them the law. Okay? It's Jewish adoption. When you're adopted, not even the parent can send you away. But the child can choose to walk away from the parent and reject the gift of adoption. Well, what does that have to do with walking with Jesus? Folks, people like to quote the scripture that says, Not, no height nor depth or all of these things. Nothing can take you from the love of God and nothing can take you from the love of God. Nothing can take you from the hand of God. But you yourself can walk away from God You can say, I do not want this. I do not want to live in your righteousness anymore. I'm going to do my own thing. I'm going to walk to gratify myself. I do not want to be adopted by you anymore. And I leave your family. You see, I promise you folks, there are not going to be people in heaven that didn't want to go there. There are not going to be people in heaven that... When they were young, or young, of course, everybody's younger when things happened in the past. But in the past, they they cried out, and they even served God. They did all kinds of things. But when they got older, they said, I do not believe in God, and I'm going to walk away. I'm going to give up on the things of God. 
And I talked last week, I think it was, about those wonderful people that say, I'll see you in hell. No, you won't. You die without Christ, you will never see another thing for all of eternity. You will know nothing but suffering. I've heard so much recently of people that are denying the idea or the place of hell. Jesus talked more about hell than he did heaven. Because it's a very real place. And at the end of Revelation, we'll get there a long time from now in our Revelation, our study of the prophecy starts next week. But as you get to the end of Revelation, we know that death, hell, and the grave will all be cast into the lake of fire for all of eternity. Hell is a real place. And when we don't walk in the Lord, we're bound for hell. But adoption gives you all the rights of a natural child. There, there, there's all these things when you're not adopted, when you don't live for God, there's so many things that, that, that you, you don't have. But whenever you are walking in the Spirit of God and you are a part of the adoption and you are a child of God, you get all the rights that come with being the child of God. As a child, you have communication or communion with God. Again, you have the ability to come before God doesn't mean you're going to get all the answers that you want the way that you want them, but God is going to take care of you. As a child, we're heirs of God's kingdom and joint heirs with Christ. So we must feed the Spirit so that we walk in the Spirit. So how do you feed the Spirit, Pastor? Well, that's the last point. Feeding the Spirit. Now, I don't know if you're still with me this morning or not, but I hope you're ready. Because I'm going to have an altar call here in just a few minutes. Not quite there yet, but in just a couple minutes, I'm going to have an altar call. And it's going to be a time to encounter God. A time to encounter the Spirit of the living God. Whatever's going on in your life, it's going to be time to come and just have an encounter with the Holy Spirit. So feeding the Spirit, you feed with the Word. Romans 10, 17. So then faith come by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. We need to put the Word of God into our mind, in our heart. We need to preach the Word of God. We need to listen to the Word of God being preached. If the only word of God you are getting is from Pastor Travis on Sunday morning, you're starving yourself to death. We feed the Spirit with our thoughts. Philippians 4.8 Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue, if there be any praise, think on these things. We've got to think on the things of God. Our mind must be renewed. Would you play for me? And the last thing is this. And this is part of this altar call. If you don't know the Lord today, that'll be the first thing. You want to give your life to Jesus this morning. And that means receiving the Holy Spirit. It's not the same as being baptized in the Holy Spirit. But the Spirit dwells within someone that is believing in Jesus. The Spirit comes and makes a home and your body becomes a temple of God. Go back a couple of weeks and listen to that one. 
You're the temple of God and you believe in Jesus. You give your life to him and you begin to walk in the spirit. But we feed our spirit with the Holy Ghost. With the Holy Spirit, not just through salvation, but through baptism in the Holy Spirit. John 14, 26 says, but the comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, with whom the Father will send in my name. He shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I have said unto you. The Holy Spirit is our comforter, our advocate. He is our counselor. He is our helper. Oh, but the Holy Spirit is much more than that. Acts chapter 1 verse 8. But you shall receive power when that the Holy Ghost has come upon you and you shall be my witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and, un, uh, and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. He's not just comfort. He's not just your counselor. He's not just your helper. He is not just your advocate to the Father. He is the power of God that exists in you. He's the breath of God that gives you life. The power and the strength and the authority to do the things that God has for you to do. In Acts chapter 2, verses 1 through 4, oh, we love these ones. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all in one accord in one place, and suddenly there came a sound from heaven, as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues as of fire, and it set upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost, and began to speak with other tongues, as the Spirit gave them utterance. Later in Scripture, in, in the book of Acts, we find that Paul shows up and there are men that believe in Jesus. And he says, have you been baptized in the Holy Ghost? And, he, and they say, we don't know this Holy Ghost that you speak of. And he says, well, what have you been baptized in? And they say, well, we've been baptized in water. John's baptism of repentance. And Paul Lays hands on them. And prays over them that they receive the Holy Ghost. And he knew that they received because they began to speak in other tongues. We're told to pray in the Spirit and with understanding. We're told in Scripture that the Spirit will give us, give us groanings that cannot be uttered. <coughs> we walk around and we claim to be Pentecostal, but are we living in the Spirit of the living God? Are we walking in the power and the authority of the living God? Because if we claim that we are walking in the power and the authority of the Spirit of the living God, then there should be a new language that is coming out of our mouth that no man can understand. That is mysteries that only God can understand. And when so needed, used as the gift of tongues for interpretation and interpreter given, but we are told to pray in the Spirit. That which comes out of us is from the Holy Ghost and we begin to pray in a tongue that we do not know. And it is a representation. Is it an evidence? They knew that they were filled with the Holy Ghost because they spoke in tongues. In Acts chapter 2, verse 14, after being baptized in the Holy Spirit, it says this, but Peter, standing up with the eleven, lifted up his voice and said unto them, you men of Judea and all ye that dwell in Jerusalem, be this known unto you and hearken my words. With the power of the Holy Spirit comes more than just speaking in an unknown language. It comes the authority to preach the word of God. Well, but I'm not a pastor. I don't care if you're a pastor. Everything that comes out of your mouth, if you claim to be a Christian, should be the word of God proceeding from your mouth, the love of God coming out of your mouth. You have a job to do to be the witness of Jesus Christ. That means to be his representative. 
the authority comes over you by the power of the Holy Ghost and boldness will happen in your life. In Acts 2.38 says, Then Peter said unto them, Oh, just keep on living your life however you want to. It'll be okay because Jesus died on the cross for you. Wait, no, that's not what it says. It says, Repent! And be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the Holy Ghost. (coughs) Repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus. You must crucify the flesh. You must put yourself to the side. Will you stand with me today? Put yourself to the side. Let yourself be put into the grave. Not complete, not physically, but spiritually you must die to the world and begin walking in the spirit of the living God. I don't know how to make it, pastor. I don't know how to make it through. You need the Holy Spirit. (laughs) The joy in my life, it just feels like it's been robbed and I have no joy in my life. You need the Spirit of the living God over your life. Pastor, I keep making the wrong choices. Well, you're not much better than Paul then because Paul said, I do the thing I don't think I should and I don't do the thing I know I'm supposed to. He says, I'm the chief of sinners. And he said, I know that I can't make it without the spirit of the living God over my life. If you're making the wrong choices, you're doing the wrong thing. You need to quit trying to stop sinning. Because you're not going to stop sinning without giving it all to Jesus and letting the Holy Spirit immerse you into himself and the love of God so that your actions start reflecting the spirit of God. That which is within you will begin to flow out of you springs of living water. It's time to give yourself up completely and receive the power and the authority of the Holy Spirit, the breath of God over your life. God, this morning we come before you and we pray the power of your Spirit right now. Lord, for those that need your comfort, Lord, let them receive that this morning. Lord, For those that need guidance over their life, let them walk in your spirit and receive the guidance that they need. For those that have been living in the shadows, afraid to step out in you, Lord, right now I pray that you would pour your power and authority over their lives, that they would step out of the shadows and live according and preach and teach and shout the name of Jesus. Lord, I pray right now that no one leave this place without a touch from you through the power of the Holy Ghost today. In Jesus' name.